Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be chapter 6 of part 2 of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. The title of this book chapter is called The Prince of the Scarlet Thread. So, this is going to be, oh, let's see, what is this? This is going to be part, Judah part 17 of the Judah Scepter and Joseph's Birthright series by J.H. Allen. So, let's get going. Uh, the Prince of the Scarlet Thread. That's a uh, reference to Genesis, the book of Genesis. So, let's take a look. While we leave our little royal remnant to make their escape, let us look about and look into the fields of revelation and history to see if we can find some royal prince to whom shall be wedded one of these princesses, princesses who are fleeing into that unknown land where the Lord has promised that those who compose this remnant shall again take root and grow. While we are making this search, it will be well to remember that God gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, and that Israel is not the name of the nation of Judah, but that it is the name of the ten-tribed kingdom, which have been div uh, driven into an unknown land almost, uh, well, about, about 100 and 39 years prior to the flight of this remnant. Bob's note here. So it was, uh, you know, about 130 some odd years. Uh, Israel had gone into captivity, the northern kingdom, uh, into the Assyrian captivity. And when the Assyrians had been conquered by Babylon, you know, all the army that was guarding Israel, doing all their, you know, the, the slave work of the Assyrians, uh, when the army left guarding Israel to go to the front lines to fight the Babylonians, and they lost, you know, the Babylonians won the battle, um, Israel decided, well, you know, we just, we've been in slavery with the Assyrians, and now they've been conquered by the Babylonians. We've heard bad things about the Babylonians, so maybe we should get out of here. So they, uh, they went north. And if you look at Assyria, Syria, Assyria, Assyria, and uh, Israel, what's north? Um, Israel, uh, let's see, you go north, um, Europe, yeah, Europe, and Asia Minor, you know, which is, uh, what they call Greece, and that area, so, matter of fact, let me show you something, all right, in, uh, now, this is just my comments right now. In Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 18, and if you read Jeremiah 30, um, 3 and verse 8, you know that God divorced Israel, but not Judah. But in Jeremiah 3.18, it says, In those days, what days? The last days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Now, wait a minute. What do you mean in those days the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel? You mean they're not walking together now? 
Huh. Yeah, ask your pastors these questions and they'll explain them away, you know, because they can't answer it with their theology. Um, so in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel and they shall come together out. They shall come together out of the land of the north. What land is north of Israel? Europe is. Europe is. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. So Israel and Judah will walk together. They're going to come up together out of the land of the north to the land of Israel that God gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob Israel. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, your average demon nominational pastor, they, you know, they can't, they can't handle that. So, all right. So, um, so when the Assyrian army left and collapsed, Israel said, uh, we better get out of Dodge. And they moved away from where the fighting was. So the fighting was to the south. So they went north. Good idea, right? So, okay, um, let's read the book. Let us also remember that the scepter with all the with all that belongs to it was promised distinctively to the um, Davidic family. Now remember, David was of Judah, one of the twelve tribes, and not to the kingdom which bore the name and not to the kingdom which bore the name of Judah, a name which together with its corrupted form, uh, Jews, is the biblical historic name of the Jewish nation. Judah, as we will remember, was the representative name of the nation, which was composed of the smaller portion of Israel's seed, because it was to Judah's blessing and standard that the people gathered who afterward became separated from the rest at Israel and were known commonly as the Jews. They are the descendants of these people who were still known as Jews. Bob's note here. Some of them, probably a, mi a minority. Um, where are the Canaanites today? I mean, they still exist. So they're not calling themselves Canaanites. They're calling themselves something else. I wonder what that is. Hmm. Yeah, they call themselves uh, Christians and you know who's. All right, let's keep reading. On the other hand, according to a prophecy which shall be cited in due time, the descendants of the ten tribe kingdom, which had been cast out into an unknown land, were to be called by another name. The fact that they were not to be known by the name of Israel cannot annul the prophecy which was uttered by Abijah as he stood upon a certain mount in Ephraim and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? Bob's note here. You go to my channel and click on that little magnifying glass and type in salt. I did an entire Bible study on salt. Yeah, Jesus said we were to be the salt of the earth. But if the salt didn't have any salty taste, it was good for nothing but to be cast to the earth. That's the Bob translation. So, yeah. Do you ask, is it possible that this little royal remnant shall have gone to the same unknown land to which they of the ten tribes had previously gone? Was it among the people that this remnant was planted and over whom the preserved scepter held its sway? Let us examine the scriptural evidence. 
Ezekiel is believed to have lived uh, as a contemporary with Jeremiah. And I believe that also. So, Ezekiel is believed to have lived uh, as a contemporary with Jeremiah by taking the testimony of chronolo chronology together with the concurrence of many historic events. All may know that this is true. Jeremiah states historic events and utters prophecies which relate chiefly to Judah, but gives only a little bit of that which pertains to Israel. While Ezekiel does the reverse of this, saying much that concerns Israel, but little that pertains to Judah. But what he does say concerning the destroyed commonwealth of Judah, the plucked up scepter, plucked, P-L-U-C-K-E-D, the plucked up scepter and the overturned throne of the royal family, whose history we are studying, does most undoubtedly furnished evidence which connects the remnant seed and their um, monarchical belongings, you know, monarch, with the exiled house of Israel, which has taken root and whose people are gathering strength in a country, the location and geographical character of which are described by the prophets and which at a time prior to the prophecies was an unknown and uninhabited wilderness. Jeremiah tells us that Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, at a period which synchronizes with the time when Zedekiah had reigned for six years. Ezekiel declares that the word of the Lord came to him, saying that he should prophesy against Judah and Jerusalem concerning the king of Babylon, who would come up against them with the sword, and that at that time he should set battering rams against the gates of the city, cast up a mount, and build a fort. The result of this would be that the city would be taken. At the same time, the message from the Lord, which was delivered by the prophet Ezekiel to Zedekiah, was, And thou, profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, when your iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem. Uh, what's a diadem? It's like part of a... Uh, has, has to do with a crown, right? Remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be upon the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more overturned until... He come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Whose right is it to come? Probably Christ. That's my guess. And that's in Ezekiel 21, 22 through 27. We have no disposition to make an attempt to give words a meaning which they will not bear, nor to attach any significance to them which the context does not clearly indicate. But these words do most certainly give us uh, to understand that there is a person, a male heir of the royal line, who is to be the immediate successor of Zedekiah to the Davidic throne. Also, these words teach that the crown is to be taken from off the head of Zedekiah, upon whom it rested at the time when this prophecy was given and placed upon the head of this person whom the scriptures designate as him that is low. So they're going to exalt him who was low and abase him that is on high, that's high. All right, let's keep reading here. These words further teach that when the royal diadem, the emblem of kingly power and exaltation is taken from the one and placed upon the head of that other person, that then the one who was previously high is abased and brought low, and that the one who hitherto was low is then exalted and made high. This is essentially so because the two men shall have then exchanged places. Furthermore, the expression, 
This shall not be the same taken together with the prophecy concerning the overturns leads us to expect a change of dynasty, at least on the side of the male line, and also a change in the territorial or geographical situation. This is still more apparent when we note that there are to be three overturns, and that after the third overturn, overturn shall uh, have been accomplished, that there shall that there are to be no more until another certain person comes. Also, after the diadem has been removed from the head of the prince who wore it at the time of the first overturn and placed upon the head of him that is low, it is to be noted that then either this man, who is the person understood as the um, uh, antecedent, A-N-T-E-C-E-D-E-N-T, -E 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 of the personal pronoun, him or his lineage, is to be dethroned by the Lord in favor of that other person who is designated as he whose right it is, and to whom it shall then be given. A uh, little note here, Bob's note. Uh, what was the uh, line of Christ? Well, if you reckon it by the father, Joseph uh, was of the tribe of Judah. Mary was a cousin of Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist. So she was a Levite, the priest tribe. So essentially you have a merging of the priests and the kings of Israel Uh, Jesus is called our high priest. He's called Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But uh, Joseph was not his father. And neither do I believe Mary was his mother. Uh, Mary carried Jesus in the womb, but, she, you know, she wasn't really my... Uh, her DNA wasn't used. The Bible records that Jesus was the second Adam. He had the same mother and father as the first Adam. Who was Adam's mother? You could say Mother Earth, I guess. But uh, and who was his father? Well, God was. The uh, book of Luke, I think it's chapter 3, records that Adam was the son of God. Well, Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God. But he whose right it is, to whom it shall then be given. And that's going to be Christ. I'm positive of that. But uh, somebody else has another idea. Well, you know, one day we'll find out. The next question for us to settle is, who is this legally possible person? That is to be the successor of Zedekiah, who is spoken of as him that is low. For he is spoken of as low only in the sense of non-ruling. By consulting the 38th chapter of Genesis, we will find a record of the conception and birth of twin boys, whose conception and birth were both accomp uh, accomp accompanied by such extraordinary circumstances that the question of their parentage is forever settled for Tamar. Their mother did willingly stoop in order that uh, she might conquer Judah, the father, and compel him to do justice by her. That's an interesting story, people. Bob's note here. Uh, if you don't know who Tamar is, may I suggest you read the book of Genesis. Oh, yeah. Judah married a Canaanite woman and had uh, three sons. Er, Onan, and I forget the other one. Uh, God killed two of them. Yeah, God killed two of those Canaanite sons. And uh, Tamar was married to uh, 
both of them. Well, the two that God killed. And then she dressed up like a whore on the road where she knew Judah was going to go. And she covered her face and probably showed off the rest of her, you know, and uh, said, uh, hey, big boy, you want some of this? Well, you know. And uh, he um, uh, he did the dirty deed with his daughter-in-law and got her pregnant. It's amazing how many one-time dirty deeds gets a guy can get a woman pregnant. But it's recorded a few times in the Bible. And uh, she had twin sons. One of them uh, had a scarlet thread. That's an interesting Bible study in and of itself. So, um, so Tamar the mother did willingly stoop in order that she might conquer Judah the father and compel him to do justice by her. The never to be forgotten manner in which Judah was forced to acknowledge that those children were his offspring and that their mother was more righteous than he does most certainly place the fact that their royal lineage beyond the possibility of cavil, C-A-V-I-L. Boy, I have no idea what that word means. I guess I'm going to have to look it up. Cavil? All right, cavil. Uh, Noah Webster, 1828 Dictionary. To raise frivolous objections. To find fault without good reason. Uh, to advance futile objections for the sake of victory in an argument. Uh, yeah. False or frivolous objections. Bearing some resemblance to truth. Advance for the sake of victory. See, Maybe, maybe I'm going to read that story about uh, uh, Judah and Tamar. All right, I found uh, Tamar. Turn to Genesis chapter 38. I'm taking a, um, I'm going down a rabbit trail here. Um, taking a, uh, we're going to take the scenic route on this book. Uh, Genesis 38, chapter 1. And it came to pass that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Er. You know, Er means wrong, right? Have you ever heard of an error? Uh, Jesus told the uh, Sadducees, ye do err not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. Yeah. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chez, Chezbid, Chebid, Chezib, C-H-E-Z-I-B, when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, Canaanite blood. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed, or children, to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, the children. And it came to pass that he, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. Uh, spilled it on the ground. He's, he, he didn't want to, uh, if you got children, you might want to uh, pause right here. Uh, he's getting ready to, uh, impregnate this girl, 
But instead of wanting to do that, he pulls out at the last second and spills it on the ground. Yeah. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he slew him also. So not only did God kill Judah's firstborn from this Canaanite woman, he killed the second one too. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also as his brother did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So here it is. Judah's like, uh, wow, God just killed two of these people, you know, two of my two sons. And if I give her my third son, well, they're all three of my kids are going to be dead. You know, that's the Bob, uh, not translation, but uh, commentary. And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears to Timnath. He and his friends, Hira the Adullamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. Um, so, and she put and she put her widow's garments off of her and covered her with a veil. You know, she covered her face with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is, by the way, to Tinmath, when she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. So Judah had no intention of his third son being killed for Tamar's sake. So she wrapped, she covered her face with a veil and, uh, that was probably the most uh, clothing she was probably wearing, except for maybe a couple strategic spots, you know. Um, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. Yeah, let me come in unto thee. Um... For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law, and she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? Oh, okay. Oh, you want some of this? Uh, it's going to cost you. So what are you going to give me? So he, he, she's asking for a pledge. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So here it is. He went in unto the girl that he gave two of his kids, his sons, right? So his signet ring, his bracelets, and his staff. So here it is. He went in to her got her pregnant, and she has his signet ring, his bracelets, and the, his staff. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, all right, so she arose, went away, laid by her the veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. So here it is, she's changing clothing. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. You know, yeah, well, she went back home and took off the harlot's clothing and pretended to be a widow. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. You know, there's no prostitute here. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass uh, about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot, and also behold, she is with child 
by whoredom. Oh. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. Yeah, let's bring this unmarried whore and let's burn her. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law father saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray thee, whose these are, the signet and bracelets and staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she hath been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. You see, Judah acknowledged, oh boy, I got, the, here it is, I'm getting ready to kill this woman because she played the harlot and she's pregnant, and yet I'm the father. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she traveled that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying, this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out and she said, how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Pharaoh's. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Now remember, Tamar and Judah were both of the royal seed line. Well, I'm guessing that uh, Tamar was of the royal Judah seed line. But here, you know, this is Judah. He's the father of the Judeans. You know, the 12 tribes. So he had twins, twin sons, and uh, usually it'd be the firstborn that would be the rightful heir to inheritance. And if there was, you know, a king in the kingdom, the firstborn would be the one to have, you know, be the king. So, all right, well, let's get back to reading the book. See this, uh, remember the title of this book is called The Prince of the Scarlet Thread. And, uh, you know, if, if you've never read Genesis, you would never know this story existed. But this is a really interesting, um, to me, I, I, I guess, yeah, I don't know. I, I consider the Bible interesting. So, when the mother was in travail and after the midwife had been summoned, there was the presentation uh, of a hand. Then for some reason, either human or divine, the midwife knew that twins were in the womb. So in order that she might know and to be able to testify which was born first, she fastened a scarlet thread on the outstretched hand. Since Judas was of the royal family in Israel and the law of primogeniture prevailed among them. I have no idea what that word means. Primogenesis? It was essential that this distinction should be made so that at the proper time, the firstborn or eldest son might ascend the throne. Yeah, that's what I thought. After the scarlet thro th thread had been made secure on the little hand, it was drawn back and the brother was born first. Upon seeing this, the midwife exclaimed, How hast thou broken forth? Then seemingly she was filled with the spirit of prophecy and said, This breach be upon thee. And because of this prophetic utterance, he was given the name of Pharaoh's, i.e. a breach. Afterward, his brother, who had the scarlet thread upon his hand, was born, and his name was called Zerah, the seed. Bob's note here. In the Old Testament, names had meanings. The word Adam uh, means ruddy, like a ruddy complexion. You ever seen somebody with white skin with reddish color? Um, it means to be able to show, to be able to blush, to show blood in the face. Um, 
a lot of names have meanings. Yeah. Joshua means salvation. Joshua, not Yeshua. Joshua. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of names have meanings in the Old Testament. I, I don't know if they all do, but uh, yeah. Let's get reading. The very fact that Pharaoh was really born first would exalt him, and it eventually did exalt his heirs to the throne of Israel, for King David was a son of Judah through the line of Pharaoh. But just so surely as a son of Judah and father David, who was, give, uh, who was the first one of the line to sit upon that throne, was given the name of Pharaoh. Just so surely must we expect, with that little hand of the scarlet thread waving prophetically before them, that a breach should occur somewhere along that family line. That breach did occur. We are now considering its history and are well into its transition period, which began when the Lord God sanctified Jeremiah, sent him into the world, and gave his commission to pull down and pluck up the exalted Pharaoh's line, and afterward to build and plant anew the scepter, throne, and kingdom, which at about the same time the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel and moved him to predict the removal of the crown from the head of the one who is high, a proceeding which not only involves the transfer of the royal diadem to another head, but also an overturning. And when both the transfer and the overturning shall have been accomplished, then the one who was low will have been exalted, and the exalted one will have been brought low. Hmm, interesting. Now, um, in the Bible, the firstborn was to be given a double portion of the father's inheritance. And uh, it was the firstborn's job to take care of his parents into their old age. And the firstborn was, you know, double portion. Well, who was the firstborn of Eve? Cain. Yeah, there was a curse upon the firstborn. Isaac, who was his firstborn? Esau. God hated him. You know, it's just the firstborn seemed like they were cursed. But um, that curse was lifted under Christ. I'm just throwing this out there. So, All right, let's keep reading this book. The immediate posterity of this Prince of the Scarlet Thread is given as follows. And the sons of Zerah, Zimri, and Ethan, and Heman, and Calcol, and Dara, five of them in all, 1 Chronicles 2 and verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6, Thus the direct posterity of Zerah was five, while that of Pharaoh's was only two. For the reasons that our Lord sprang out of Judah through the line of Pharaoh's, the unbroken genealogy of that family is given in the sacred records, but the genealogy of the Zerah family is given only intermittently. One thing is made quite clear in the Bible concerning the sons of Zerah, and that is, that they were famous for their intelligence and wisdom, for it was only the great God-given wisdom of Solomon, which is declared to have risen above theirs, as is seen by the following. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East, for he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Hermon, and Cal, Cal, and Dara, 1 Kings 4, verses 29 through 31. Furthermore, we find that two of them, Ethan and Herm Heman, uh, were also noted singers, as we find by consulting the 15th chapter of 1 Kings and the 19th verse. By noting the titles of the 88th and 89th Psalms, we also see that one of them was composed by Heman, Heman, the 
Ezraite, and that the other was a song of Ethan the Ezraite. It is not at all unlikely and would be but natural that Zimri, who overthrew Basha, the third king of Israel, not Judah, belonged to the posterity of Zimri, the firstborn son of Zerah, son of Judah, and twin brothers, a uh, twin brother of Pharaoh's. For as we have shown, the seed of Jacob were at that time divided into two kingdoms, with the posterity of Pharaoh's on the throne, ruling over the kingdom of Judah. How natural it would be for them, for the then living members of the family to think and to say, this is the long foretold breach for which we have been taught to look. This is the time to assert our royal prerogatives to take the throne and rule over this, the house of Israel. It would be but natural for another reason, namely, there has always been an attempt to fulfill in the natural every promise that the Lord God has made to his chosen people. He promised Abraham and Sarah that they should have a son. In order that they might accomplish this end, Sarah gave and Abraham took Hagar, her handmaid, and the result was Ishmael. Uh, Bob's note here, I did an entire study on Ishmael and the Arabs in Bible prophecy. The Lord um, told Abraham that Ishmael, he would bless Ishmael for Abraham's sake, but a Ishmael was not to be the chosen seed. He was not to be the chosen seed. That one thing in the Bible alone negates Islam. Period. Islam is not another gospel. Well, it is it is another gospel that Paul said was accursed. You know, it's cursed. Islam and, and is is cursed. Do you know that Japan will not allow a mosque in their country? They have more sense than uh, the so-called Christians in America. Yeah. Uh, before Jacob and Esau were born, the birthright was promised to the younger. Remember, Esau was the firstborn. Okay. Jacob was the younger. But the birthright was promised to the younger. Jacob the younger undertook to accomplish this in the natural by making by taking unjust advantage of his brother and deceiving his father. So with Joseph, after God had promised the birthright to him, he undertook in the natural to take advantage of the blindness of Jacob. Nevertheless, God in his own good time gave Sarah strength to conceive and settled with repentant wrestling Jacob and outwitted maneuvering Joseph. Uh, that doesn't make any sense at all to me. So now in his own good time, he has also made the predicted breach, which shall result in the bringing down of the line of Pharaohs, the high, and which shall exalt the prosperity of Zerah, the low. And that, everybody, is the end of chapter six, uh, part two of this book, chapter six. Uh, it ends in page 206, 206. So all blessings, praise, glory and honor to God the Father and his only begotten son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.